So I have never received so many comments, emails, and messages about a specific video than I have with this latest video from what I've learned, which is all about why he believes that reducing meat won't save the planet. You guys have messaged me hundreds of times asking me to respond to this video. And so I decided out of curiosity to check the video out. And yeah, I absolutely agree. This is definitely a video that needs responding to, which is exactly what I'm going to do in today's video. Joseph, who is the person behind what I've learned, makes so many ridiculous and anti-scientific points. And I'm gonna go through and debunk each and every one of them so you guys can see why what Joseph is saying is based on junk science and does not reflect the reality of the damage that animal farming is causing. So the first thing to address is the person that Joseph interviews and the person who provides the bulk of the evidence for the arguments made in the video is someone called Dr. Frank Mitlerner. Now, Dr. Frank Mitlerner is relatively well known within the environmental scene because he has paid hundreds of thousands of dollars by the animal agriculture industries. The Beef Checkoff have paid him. The National Pork Board have paid him. They pay him to do research about the impact of animal farming in the environment, which seems awfully suspicious and might explain why Dr. Frank Mitlerner's opinions about the damage that animal farming causes is so at odds with the mainstream scientific community. Why is it that the man who is paid by these industries is presenting an argument that goes against the consensus and just so happens to favour the industries that are funding his research. Not only that, but Dr. Frank Mitlerner has also been criticized by experts for using incorrect numbers and failing to include really important information in the research that he carries out. So the first point that I wanted to address is the point that Joseph makes about animal feed, because Joseph says that the majority of the food that animals consume isn't food that humans could consume. Now there's a couple of problems with Joseph's argument, and the first one to address is related to the chart that he uses to prove his point, because the chart is showing how how much food in terms of weight is given to these animals. But the weight isn't important because it's about the energy, how many calories these foods have within them. That's how the percentages should be worked out when we see the chart with how much food is given to animals. After all, Joseph actually makes this point himself later in the video when he says this. Also, consider that nutritionists don't just say, a human needs precisely two pounds of general food material per day. So just quickly to illustrate my point, one kilogram of oats will provide about 3,800 calories, but one kilogram of pasture grass will only provide about 539, which means you'd need seven kilograms of pasture grass to have the same number of calories as one kilogram of oats. This is why it's important that when we calculate the food that's given to animals, we do it by metrics that are actually important and weight is not the most important metric. But to be honest, that's kind of irrelevant because it doesn't really matter whether or not the majority of the food that animals consume is or isn't food that humans could consume. That's not what's relevant when we talk about how land is used. Really, the argument that vegans make is that this land could be put to better use. Now, to give you a sense of perspective, in the US, animal farming uses 10 times more land than plant-based farming for human consumption. Joseph also makes the point that the crop residues from crop production for humans are also given to animals as well. But what Joseph conveniently glosses over is the fact that food is grown exclusively for animals. If we look in the US again, according to US government data, about 77.3 million acres of land in the US is used to grow food for humans, but 127.4 million acres is used to grow food exclusively for animals. And so when we talk about using that land and putting it to better use, research has shown that if we took that cropland, the cropland where we grow crops just for animals, and instead grew human edible foods, particularly fruits, vegetables, and pulses, we could grow enough food to feed another 350 million people in full just with the land in the US that is currently used to grow animal feed. This is what we're saying when we say that we don't want to consume what animals consume. Instead, we want to repurpose that land and put it to better use. And this also doesn't even include the 650 million acres or so of pasture and grazing land in the US, which would also be freed up and which we could do something else with. And also when it comes to the crop residues, if we stopped farming animals, those crop residues wouldn't just go to waste. There are so many other things that we can do with them. For example, we could compost them and then we could put the compost into the soil and increase soil fertility and soil health. 
We could also turn the crop residues into bioenergy, and by using that, we can reduce the amount of fossil fuels that we use for energy. Or alternatively, we could turn the crop residues into things like sustainable paper and sustainable packaging. In other words, they won't go to waste just because we're not feeding animals. And actually, what we could do with the crop residues instead would be significantly better for the environment and for us than what we currently do with them. So let's now talk about greenhouse gas emissions because Joseph makes the claim that if the entire US went vegan, that would only reduce emissions by about 2.6%. Now to support that claim, Joseph cites a paper. The paper has two authors and one of the authors is someone called Robin White, who is the assistant professor at the Animal and Poultry Sciences Department of Virginia Tech. Now this department at Virginia Tech work closely with an organization called the American Meat Science Association. Now the AMSA basically do what Big Tobacco did during the 20th century. They have industry funded scientists and researchers who produce evidence that they then publish and distribute to the press using their PR team to try and cast doubt in the eyes of the consumer about the legitimacy of the claims being made against animal agriculture. Now in 2020, the AMSA awarded someone called Bradley Johnson their Distinguished Research Award for the work that he's done talking about red meat and health. Even though the work that Bradley Johnson has done about red meat and health has been disputed and criticized by leading health organizations such as the American Heart Association, the American Cancer Society, and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Now his research was criticized not only because it was scientifically incorrect, but because he had purposefully used poor methodology to create the findings that he wanted to create. And he also didn't disclose that he'd been paid by by the beef industry for the research that he did. Now that is the person that the AMSA awarded their Distinguished Research Award to back in 2020, and the AMSA worked closely with this department at Virginia Tech that one of the lead authors of this paper also works for. And the other author of the paper is someone called Mary Beth Hall, who just so happens to be a dairy research scientist. So perhaps with this in mind, you won't be so surprised to hear that Robert and Mary made some very interesting decisions when they came up with the figure of 2.6%. Firstly, they made the absolutely ridiculous assumption that if we stopped farming animals, we would still produce all the feed that we currently do to feed these animals, even though the animals wouldn't exist anymore, and instead humans would have to consume the feed. The author Robin White also further supported this assumption in an interview that she did where she said this, In our current agriculture system, if animals were removed, we would have to consume the products that those animals now consume, explains White. That would mean consumers' diets would probably be 85% concentrate materials, including significant amounts of cereals, grains, and soybean flour. So just to clarify, the person that we're supposed to regard as being a credible authority in a scenario where the US goes vegan just so happens to believe that if that did happen, we would still grow all of the feed that we currently do for animals but then we would have to consume it instead as humans. Because according to Robin White, it wouldn't be possible to, well, I guess just not grow the feed in the first place or grow something else like we could if we took that cropland and grew fruits and vegetables and pulses to feed another 350 million people. But it gets even more astonishing than that because they also made the assumption that people will be consuming 4,000 700 calories, so twice the recommended daily amount. And on top of that, they also made the assumption that in a vegan food system, we would burn all of the crop residues. Why would we burn the crop residues? Why? 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 Why on earth would we do that when, like I explained before, there are so many other things that we can do with them. Yet these authors have made, again, a ridiculous assumption in presuming that we would just burn them. So now it seems fairly obvious, doesn't it, that the two authors, Robin and Mary, have made some very interesting decisions and have made some very ridiculous assumptions, which just so happen to undermine the potential impact of going vegan. Now, I wonder why it would be 
that two researchers who work within the animal agriculture industries would do such a thing. Now, the problem is Joseph adds a false sense of legitimacy to that study when he says this. Accounting for everything, the methane from cow burps, the emissions from animal manure, emissions from transporting and processing meat and so on. But the problem is they don't account for everything. And beyond that, they make ridiculous and implausible assumptions to create the figure that they have created. And on another point that Joseph makes about emissions, he makes the claim that only about 2% of emissions in the US come from cattle. Now, let's say that that is true for just a moment. 2% for one food item is still an incredibly large amount, especially when we consider that in the US, beef products only make up about 3% of the caloric intake of people in the US. So if 100% of the calories consumed in the US came from foods with the same emissions as beef, then the emissions from agriculture would be nearly six and a half times higher than they currently are. Not to mention that about half of all agricultural land in the US is used for beef production, which incidentally is about 20% of the entire land mass of the US. This means that if 100% of calories came from foods with the same land footprint as beef, it would take six and a half United States to produce enough food for everyone in the United States. But all of this aside, the 2% figure that Joseph cites doesn't actually take into account the full impact of beef production. It only takes into account something called direct emissions, which are basically the belches and the manure produced by the cattle. However, when we want to look at the full impact of a food item, we have to look at the full life cycle. Because when we go into a supermarket and buy a piece of beef, we're not just responsible for the direct emissions, we're responsible for everything that has happened in the production of that product up until the point that we pick it up in the supermarket. Which is why when you calculate the environmental impact of something, you have to look at what is called life cycle analyses. And so when you look at a life cycle analysis of beef production in the US, the emissions caused by beef is actually 3.7% and not the 2% that Joseph claims. It's also important to mention that leading researchers are also saying that the agricultural methane emissions are actually being underestimated and are potentially even higher than we've been led to believe. So let's do this figure now because there was a meta-analysis that identified over 1,500 studies for potential inclusion. It looked at nearly 40,000 farms in 119 countries around the world and drew its data from full life cycle analyses. This meta-analysis is considered the most comprehensive analysis that's ever been conducted exploring the relationship between farming and the environment. Now, this analysis stated that if the US changed to a plant-based food system, the agricultural emissions in the US could be reduced by about 61 to 73%. So the USDA estimates that in the US, about 10.5% of emissions comes from agriculture, which means that shifting to a plant-based food system would reduce emissions in the US by somewhere between 6.4 to 7.7%. But because we've also swapped to a plant-based food system, we've also freed up a huge amount of agricultural land. And like I said earlier, there's something else that we can do with this land other than growing crops on it. Because firstly, some of the land in the US isn't suitable for growing crops on, but more importantly, we don't want to grow crops on all of the agricultural land that currently exists. We don't want to use it for food. And what we want to do with that land is restore it, reforest it and rewild it, return that land back to nature and allow the natural vegetation to return to that land. Now this meta-analysis estimates that if we took the agricultural land currently used for animal farming and returned it to nature, we could sequester 8.1 billion tons of carbon dioxide every single year. Now, 8.1 billion tons is equivalent to about 15% of the total emissions that we produce every single year. Now, that figure is a global figure, but consider this. In the US, the amount of agricultural land per person is double the world average. So what this means is the carbon capture potential of returning US agricultural land back to its natural state might even be higher than it would be for other countries around the world. And so that 15% figure might even be higher when applied to the carbon capture potential in the US. But even if we just take that 15% figure, what that means is that switching to a plant-based food system in the US would not only reduce emissions by somewhere between 6.4 to 7. 
0.7%, but it would also create the opportunity to sequester a further 15% of the emissions. So what this ultimately means is that switching to a plant-based food system would actually give us the potential to address somewhere between 21.4 and 22.7% of the emissions produced by the US. But how does this all relate to the carbon cycle that Joseph talks about? Grass takes up carbon from the air by photosynthesis. Then cow eat that plant and its carbon. And in the cow, the carbon is turned into methane, which is carbon and four hydrogens, CH4. Methane is then released into the air when the cow burps. Then in about 10 or 12 years, it's broken down into water and carbon dioxide. Carbon is then again taken from the atmosphere by the plant and the cow eats the plant and so on. What this means is that the cow is not adding new carbon to the atmosphere. The methane it emits is made out of the carbon the grass got from the air in the first place. Now that sounds like a really sustainable system, doesn't it? Well, it's wrong. So the carbon cycle would normally be that through the process of photosynthesis, grass or vegetation absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. As the plant then respires or decays, the carbon is released back into the atmosphere. This is called a closed carbon cycle because there are no net changes to the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And consequently, this cycle doesn't have a negative impact. However, when we add ruminant animals into that carbon cycle, the cycle ultimately changes because the ruminant animals create methane, which is a more potent gas than carbon dioxide. In fact, it's 86 times more potent over a 20 year period than carbon dioxide. So the introduction of ruminant animals is creating a significantly more potent gas that wouldn't have existed if the ruminant animals weren't introduced in the first place. So when the methane is then released into the atmosphere for the 10 to 12 years that it exists as methane in the atmosphere, it's contributing to global warming. This is something that Joe Joseph completely glosses over. And so yes, the methane will eventually turn to carbon dioxide, but only after it's been contributing to global warming for 10 to 12 years as a gas that is significantly more potent than carbon dioxide. So in essence, we introduce cattle into the carbon cycle. The cattle take part of the carbon from the carbon cycle, and they turn that carbon into methane, which is a significantly more potent gas. That methane is then released into the atmosphere, contributes to the global warming effect for 10 to 12 years, then turns back to carbon and the process repeats itself. However, if we take the ruminant animals out of that cycle, we remove the methane from that cycle. And as a consequence, we return to the carbon cycle that I described at the beginning, which doesn't have a negative impact. The reason that ruminant animals are bad for the environment when it comes to greenhouse gases is because they take carbon from the cycle and turn it into a gas that is significantly more potent, more damaging, and wouldn't have existed if the cattle hadn't have been introduced in the first place. And actually the fact that methane has such a short life is even more of a reason for us to eliminate animal agriculture as quickly as we possibly can. Because in doing so, we remove one of the biggest emitters of one of the most potent gases that's currently contributing to the problem. By removing these emissions, it buys us more time because it slows down the global warming effect. And by slowing down that process, we have more time to address the carbon in the atmosphere. And one of the best ways that we can remove carbon from our atmosphere is turning agricultural land back to its natural state and sequestering that carbon. But unfortunately, this isn't what's happening because between 1990 and 2016, agricultural methane emissions increased by nearly 20%. Now, the thing is, Joseph then literally goes on to prove why what he's talking about when it comes to the carbon cycle doesn't actually make any sense because he starts talking about food waste. And the reason that food waste is such a problem is because when the food decays, it releases methane into the atmosphere. However, the carbon cycle argument could easily be applied to this situation as well, considering that plants are part of the carbon cycle. However, Joseph is trying to tell us that methane released by animals is part of this really sustainable cycle and isn't an issue at all, 
but methane released by plants is a really big environmental concern. Now that's not to say that food waste isn't a problem because I'm sure Joseph and I will agree that food waste is something that needs addressing and should be reduced. But the problem is Joseph is creating a false dichotomy where he's saying that you can't care about food waste and be plant-based when of course you can. You can be vegan eating a plant-based diet and also reduce food waste. And that would be the most beneficial thing that we can do in terms of reducing methane emissions. So the next point that Joseph makes is about water Water consumption because Joseph makes the claim that about 94% of the water that is used in the production of beef is so-called green water. In other words, it's rainwater and doesn't have a negative impact on the environment when it's used and instead we should be more concerned with blue water usage. Now I do agree with Joseph that there should be nuance in the discussion about water consumption that takes into account the different types of water that has been used to produce food. I agree with that point but Joseph is also missing the point because it's not about the percentage of green water versus blue water. It's about the overall amount of blue water that has been used to produce these food items. And so when we look at the source that Joseph himself cites, you can see that plant production uses less blue water than animal product production. So in other words, it's completely irrelevant if producing beef uses 94% green water, because what's relevant is the fact that producing beef uses considerably more blue water than producing plants. And so if you want to reduce your blue water usage, eating a plant-based diet is the best thing that you can do. Now, the only outlier on that table are the nuts. And so a point that Joseph and I are potentially going to agree upon is that we should be reducing the amount of almonds from California that we're consuming. But Joseph is trying to make the argument that because almonds use a lot of water, it's therefore acceptable to consume animal products even though animal products consume a lot of blue water. When actually the argument we should be making is that it's probably more sustainable to swap from almond milk to oat milk. And besides, oat milk lattes are significantly better than almond milk lattes. And also, if we really are concerned about blue water usage in California, like Joseph very clearly is, then it's worth noting that in California, the production of animal feed and alfalfa, hay, and straw uses more blue water than the almond industry, which means that the animal agriculture industries are contributing more to the problem that Joseph is talking about than the almond industry is. And also California is the largest dairy producing state in the US. And actually the dairy industry is the number one source of agricultural income to the state of California. And so consider this, 80% of the world's almonds come from California. But when it comes to milk, only 20% of the US milk consumption comes from California. So 80% of global consumption versus 20% of US consumption. Now that's something worth thinking about next time you're ordering a cow milk latte. It's also worth noting that the source that Joseph cites to make his point about the impact of almond production in California says this in the conclusion. More generally, our results are consistent with other research that shows that a plant-based diet leads to less of an environmental impact, including water use, energy use, pesticides and fertilizer. To be fair to Joseph, he does then concede that beef production uses more blue water than crop production, but he justifies the extra blue water usage by saying that beef contributes more nutrients than white rice. But comparing beef to white rice is hardly a fair comparison, especially as white rice is a refined carb and we should of course be consuming brown rice. However, if we look at Joseph's source, we can see that just from a blue water perspective, one ton of beef uses the same amount of blue water as two tons of pulses, one ton of fruits, two tons of vegetables, and two tons of starchy roots. And on top of that, the authors of the study that Joseph cites even said this within the study. The general conclusion is that from a fresh water resource perspective, it is more efficient to obtain calories, protein, and fat through crop products than animal products. Again, this is the source that Joseph cites. Also, when Joseph is comparing beef to white rice, he also says that you get liver when you consume beef, but he makes out that for 200 grams of beef, you'll also get 200 grams of liver, which is just obviously not true. So when you kill a cow, you'll get about 200 kilos of beef, but you'll only get about 5.5 kilos of liver. What this means is that for every kilo of beef, you only get about 27.5 grams of liver. So for the 200 grams of beef that Joseph is citing, you'll only get 5.5 grams of liver and not the 200 grams 
grams that he says that you'll get. And so this brings me back to the point that I was making earlier, because this is such an obvious miscalculation. Of course, you're not gonna get 200 grams of liver for every 200 grams of beef that you get from a cow. Of course, that's not the case. And when we look at all the arguments that Joseph has been making, they're all based on very obvious miscalculations or very clear junk science, based on clear misinterpretations of the data. And so this leads me again to two conclusions. On the one hand, either Joseph is really naive and he doesn't understand the concepts he's talking about. He's interviewing people like Dr. Frank Mitlerner who are using industry propaganda to create a negative impression of the benefits of going vegan. Or alternatively, he is aware, but he has an ulterior motive. And so I'll leave it up to you guys to decide whether or not Joseph is just being naive or if he has an ulterior motive. But at the end of the day, the facts are the facts. And there is a reason why what we're being told by the scientific community is contradictory to what this video is trying to present to us. There is a reason why what Dr. Frank Mitlerner says is the opposite of what we're being told by the leading scientific organizations around the world and the most credible authorities on the issues of climate change. There is a reason where what Dr. Frank says is the polar opposite. And that is because he is paid by the animal agriculture industries and works within the animal agriculture industries. And so his job is creating evidence that contradicts the scientific consensus because the scientific consensus is against what he does for a living. And so it's really important for us to recognize why the arguments in the video are contradicting the scientific consensus. And it's so important for us to recognize that as soon as a little bit of scrutiny or even just common sense are applied to the arguments that Joseph is making, they no longer hold up. Very clearly, they don't hold up. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I really do appreciate it. If you were sent this video by your vegan friend, I hope that it clarifies why your friend is vegan. And I hope it clarifies why they've gone vegan for the environment and of course for the animals as well. And I hope you realize now why Joe's video is not a good resource or an accurate resource and instead is filled with junk science that misrepresents the data and often just completely misses the point. But all right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it and I'll see you all in the next video.